Thank you everyone for joining us today for the session on smart vision for predictive and preventive industrial operations. Um, I'm here today. My name is Madhuri Perry. I work uh, with Amazon Professional Services. I'm a senior practice manager here. I've been uh, here for close to five years. I'm here with uh, David Finocchio from Conoco Phillips. Let's get started with the session. So here is how we are going to spend the next 30 minutes or so. David will start off with walking you through the business case and also share some of the challenges that they face um, as operations engineer uh, in the oil and gas fields. Um, then what we will do is take you through the solution and then um, share some of the repeat patterns that you could take back as learnings and apply them to your use cases. Um, in uh, along the way, in addition, we are going to also share some of the nuanced uh, challenges that we faced, uh, the items that could possibly be um, reused in your use cases as well. Um, so that when you attempt the solution, you could apply the solution pattern with all the uh, specific challenges that you will learn today. With that, let me turn this over to David. Thank you, Maduri. Hello, everyone. My name is David Finocchio. I've been working for ConocoPhillips for about 14 years in engineering and operations. And throughout my career, I've witnessed a number of facilities where skilled personnel do repetitive tasks over and over. And it's been exciting to partner with AWS and develop a machine vision solution to try to tackle this issue and redeploy people to more value-adding tasks. In doing so, we've, we've made strides toward what we call operation by exception. And when someone operates by exception, it means that they're, instead of routine, it means that they can cover more facilities and, and more areas um, within a given you know, facility span of control. And the particular machine vision solution that we've worked um, with AWS in developing uh, provides, also provides multiple virtual instruments through a single device. The next few slides will prevent, present some information on a high-level business case for how this solution offers value to ConocoPhillips. Um, but to start with, I want to paint a picture for you on what a typical uh, operator experiences on the north slope of Alaska. So in a typical day, uh, people work about 12 hour shifts. They spend two to four hours driving on gravelly and snowy roads. Um, in the summertime, there's 24 hours of light, whereas in the wintertime, there's 24 hours of darkness. And um, within that scope of responsibility in terms of facilities, an operator will cover three to six well sites. Each of those sites has two, 20 to 60 wells or one to six modules that house a number of various pieces of process equipment. There's also a whole host of interconnecting pipeline and cabling and instruments. Um, when we talk about operating by routine, we mean that an operator must go to every single site and every single day. So while they're there, they're checking things like piping, wellhead pressures, safety valve sit positions, uh, safety system functions, and general integrity for leaks and spills and damage. Um, while intermixed with those activities, they also spend time approving and supporting maintenance activity. So that might be executing work, um, planning and permitting, de-energizing equipment, or making it safe for folks to actually work on it. We also ask them to optimize production as they have time with all those other tasks that they're doing. Um, and that includes adjusting valve set points, taking fluid samples, or troubleshooting problems with various pieces of process equipment. The facilities themselves um, and the people working in them are exposed to a number of extreme conditions, as you might imagine, in the Arctic. And that includes temperatures as cold as minus 50, wind speeds up to 100 miles per hour. As I mentioned, 24 hours a day and night, depending on the seasons. And then you have, being a cold environment in an Arctic environment, you have blowing snow, heavy frost. And our facilities are also handling flammable components being in the oil and gas industry. So that means that the people's tools, the vehicles, and the equipment themselves cannot act as ignition sources and must adhere to electrical area classification requirements. So when you consider all the things that an operator has to do, um, even, even basic tasks, as you can imagine, can, can take quite a bit of time. And so in a desired future state, we're seeking a solution to automate some of those routine operations so that we can achieve an equal or better level of surveillance and eventually move more toward operation by exception instead of by routine. This desired future state has the potential to realize both tangible and intangible business values. So for us, um, you know, improved surveillance improves our ability to make sure our sites are safe and operating in a compliant manner. Um, in terms of reducing routine tasks, uh, we're able to devote more time toward production optimization and reducing downtime associated with maintenance activity. 
And when you're, whenever you're doing those things and spending less time driving out to your facilities, you're less exposed to that risk that we all probably would consider the most hazardous thing we do day in and day out, and that being driving. That has potential to you know, reduce wear and tear in the vehicles, reduce fuel consumption, and result in an overall safer operation. So in a, te a technology that achieves all of these things um, means that a given operator can potentially handle more wells and more facilities within their span of control. And this could allow for a deployment of really talented people to other new facilities and optimize staffing at those facilities. And then at new facilities, we might be able to harness that benefit that I mentioned with, with the camera providing a, um, a number of different virtual instruments from a single device. So now that you understand how that machine vision might provide business value to our operation, um, there are a number of other challenges that must be considered and when trying to deploy such a solution in a harsh Arctic environment. The first being related to the weather, as I alluded to before. So you can't just use any IP camera in the Arctic, and you can't use any IP camera in an industrial facility like ours. So you can probably imagine what effect you know, frost and snow would have on the lens. So the system must be suited for Arctic conditions, uh, minus 50 degrees, heavy blowing snow, frost accumulation, and kind of a, having a self-heating effect on the, the lens device itself. As I mentioned before, the devices themselves cannot act as explosion uh, trigger points or ignition points in the facilities. And then our sites are very remote, so that every, it means that everything that we install must be industrial grade and that our people must be able to maintain that equipment. Um, it's not like we can swing by a local Best Buy and, and grab a spare part when something breaks. So it has to be something that matches other equipment we have at our facilities and is within the skill set of the personnel on site to maintain. We also have a number of facilities of varying age, and that means that our network interconnectivity uh, between those sites varies considerably. On our newest sites, we have high bandwidth, low latency fiber optic connections, but a lot of our older facilities were designed with microwave communication systems designed for minimal instrument and facilities. So this means that a solution uh, developed at these facilities and deployed must be able to handle these varying uh, levels of bandwidth and latency and, and overall connectivity between sites. We do have the benefit of a third party uh, cellular network in the field. However, when you're accessing a network via a third party solution, it also introduces some additional security measures that must be taken, which is another layer of complexity that has to be considered in the design. In the next few slides, uh, Material present a number of uh, details on how we chose to solve this solution um, to achieve our desired business outcomes and overcome the challenges that I presented. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, so you have heard what David was uh, sharing from a business case point of view. And then um, you also heard from him some of the value add that this uh, solution build out will bring to them. Um, so from a business point of view, what we really wanted to take, um, uh, give a solution to is really in just the video feed or the remote location uh, monitoring through a camera feed. So we are ingesting that feed and then we are going to process that so through some intelligence and deliver a value in the form of an alert or a, even a video clip of what's happening out there in the field remotely. So with that, there are three primary patterns here that we want to focus on. The first pattern really is uh, using a simple camera, um, which means it doesn't have any IoT SDKs or KVS or any of the uh, additional AWS components on it. Uh, it's a plain simple camera with uh, OnWIF and RTSP supported feeds, and that connects to a gateway. So the gateway is the piece of hardware that really is um, having AWS service and that's serving as an aggregator point which is connecting to the cloud. This is the pattern that we have used and deployed at Conoco. We'll dive deep into this particular pattern. Um, the second pattern and the third pattern are more here for your reference. And these are the items that probably you could use based on your use case if it makes sense. So the smart camera, uh, what that means is really we have the IoT SDK and the KVS installed on it and it directly connects to cloud. 
as you would see the compute directly resides on the smart camera which basically means that um, any of the intelligence that you want to deploy really resides directly on the camera the third one really is a smart camera with the gateway and this can come into picture if you have uh, some form of um, um, connection um, intermittent connection issue and that's where the gateway could act as a buffer for storing the video feeds when the connectivity is not there. So with that, let me uh, dive a little into the solution. But prior to uh, going deep into the solution, I wanted to give you a refresher on two key services that are part of this particular architecture. The first one is Amazon Kinesis Video Streams. So the Kinesis Video Streams is a managed service that automatically provisions and elastically scales the infrastructure that you need to um, obtain a secure video ingestion. Whether it is from one camera or thousands of cameras, all of these can be done through sing, uh, simple APIs. It has uh, APIs to help capture, process, and store the video streams that are coming in or being consumed. Um, you could integrate directly with other machine learning uh, based AWS managed services with KDS. Um, again, next, um, the next service that I wanted to touch upon is the IoT Greengrass, AWS IoT Greengrass. And what we wanted to um, use this for is primarily a disconnected environment with ConocoPhillips. So it, Greengrass provides you that ability to store and process locally while there is no connectivity. And when connectivity resumes, it sends it over to the cloud. And the second element that really Greengrass provides here is the ability to run the compute intelligence, whether it is business rules or defining which camera feed to ingest, what are the gauge reading values or ranges for each gauge. All of these elements are hosted by Greengrass. In addition, of course, we have the machine learning models, whether it is a certain type of a gauge or a valve, and what are the specific readings within a particular gauge, all of these are hosted in Greengrass as well. And of course, uh, it also can provide additional um, features like connectors um, and many more, uh, like secrets management and others. So with that, let's um, jump into the architecture here. So what you're seeing on your screen here is to the far left, the IoT cameras, the simple cameras in our case, and the video feed from each of these cameras is being ingested or pulled into the gateway device, which is um, the brown box in there. On the gateway device, we have IoT Greengrass, which is running, and that's the software uh, layer, which is uh, performing bulk of the heavy lifting and as part of the preparatory step for train and configure what we are doing is to the right uh, having a set of data set that is being um, used for performing training and configuring of the machine learning model and that model once the training has been done will be pushed down through iot greengrass to the edge device um, of course the control plane for iot greengrass resides in the cloud and your uh, instances of greengrass can be any uh, site out there in the field what that also means is um, you could control from the control plane in the cloud, which of the sites uh, get which configurations, which machine learning models, and so on. So the first step, of course, is uh, as indicated by the number one here, is discovering the camera and ingesting the video feed. The second step is really um, taking the video frames that are being ingested by the camera and now applying the machine learning intelligence on it uh, to detect the various types of gauges in the valve and performing inference of their values as well. The third step here is applying the business rules on top of these inferences. So if a gauge beats or uh, breaches a threshold rather, um, you would want to go ahead and perform some notification. Those business rules are um, additional lambdas, which are indicated by number three here. Then the fourth step is, if you were to um, identify an alert 
um, you do want to share a clip of what has happened with the operator who is remote so they have that additional degree of confidence that uh, in and around that time of the alert what else has been happening um, in the point of interest. Then the fifth step is really sending that message payload over to the IoT gateway. Um, and then from there, how you want to take an action, uh, whether it is through a simple notification in SNS or storing that alert value in a DynamoDB and creating your own custom rules and intelligence saying after a series of 10 alerts, now go ahead and um, give me a notification or escalate it. All of those you could uh, go ahead and create. The final step here is uh, you do want to open it up to your end users through either API gateway or additional services um, that your users would want to use. So that kind of um, takes us full um, uh, walkthrough of the entire architecture. What we are going to see now is the pattern two, um, which basically means we are using a smart camera. And as you can see, the key difference here is um, having a SDK right on the camera itself. And that would um, send through direct API calls um, the video feed to the cloud directly and further downstream processing happens here. And then the pattern three, which is yet another variation, is uh, really the green grass sits on top of the smart camera, which means if there is intermittent connectivity, you have that buffer layer in between. Now with all these patterns at the back of mind, you know what a um, high level architecture that you could use in your business case could be. Um, but what I want to really share are some of the learnings that we had at Conoco, uh, which will put a practical shade of color on top of this uh, theoretical concept here. So uh, with that said, the first challenge that we uh, ran into is really the data set generation. As you would imagine, a given well site doesn't necessarily render, uh, lend itself to just changing the gauge uh, readings by turning off or on different um, pump pressures and uh, pumping speeds and so on. So we cannot really do that, which means that how do we know when a gauge reading changes from say 100 to 200 or 400? We need to be able to create that data set. So what we did was um, instead uh, we said, okay, you know what, let's start with a single image as you are seeing in the top left here. And for each needle position that the gauge goes through, we are going to gather a single reading. So it's a specific class. So for every gauge position, we created 270 readings. Then those 270 images now have to be tilted, rotated, skew, uh, various lighting conditions and so on um, for accounting for the practical use in different well sites and 1,000 images for each image was generated and that gave us 270,000 images. So you will see that when we deployed these models to the gateway at the edge, it ends up seeing on the screen, you will see the green boxes are the gauges, the blue and the oranges there are the little valves. And to the right of the screen, you're seeing, even though the camera is picking up really blurry images, because the needle position is what we are inferencing on, based on the gauge type, we do know uh, with a relatively really high accuracy uh, what the specific reading of the gauge is based on the needle position. Um, so that's the beauty of the data set generation and how we went about solving that problem. The rest of the problem is really uh, relatively simple. So once you breach a threshold, we sent a SNS notification. Um, the one on the right is the message um, that you receive and the details of the messages through uh, chime notification are the ones you see on the left. And when you want to um, take it full circle and show it to the web app that I mentioned the operators would uh, use, is uh, this is what you're seeing. You're seeing the alerts on the left here and the summary of all the gauges and the valves and their exact values. And to the right, you're also seeing a video clip that they're able to visualize. 
So um, the second part of it, you might be wondering, that's great that data set generation is um, solved for us now. Um, tell me, how did you take it to edge? And you would be wondering probably, do I host it on a server or a virtual machine or maybe a Raspberry Pi? And um, the answer is really, well, what do you want to uh, purchase for your edge hardware device when you're deploying this solution? And the question really can get complicated based on how much GPU do you need, how much CPU do you need, how much would the models um, be using, how many of these models do you want to deploy, how many cameras are really feeding the data to a gateway. All of these could add a degree of complexity to your edge solution. And um, add to that, uh, each ML uh, particular algorithm also gives you a variation based on the chipset that you need to use. Um, all in all, this can get really um, complex, but you do have a managed service from Amazon uh, called SageMaker Neo that does take your input model and compile it into a vendor-specific binary. So the only um, input that you are going to provide it is really the model location in S3 bucket, and you will tell the ML framework that you have used and the target device that you need to compile it to. And in my case, it's a Jetson Nano, so it just generates the binary. So let me walk you through this demonstration here um, of what's happening. So what you are seeing here are two EC2 instances. Um, the one of them is really a camera feed, which is um, a live feed of a video camera that we have recorded and just uh, deployed on the EC2 instance. It is hosted on this uh, particular public IP address. So what I will do is launch that IP to a VLC player so I can see the RTSP feed from that particular camera. This particular location is being tagged as cint. So what I would um, um, be able to validate with is really uh, use that particular URL so I can see the actual feed directly coming from the well site itself. So from there, what we would do is um, also see the second EC2 instance, which has green grass. And that particular instance, like you can see, it has lambdas and the machine learning algorithms and the connectors. So now what will happen is, as you can see, it has a recorder function and it also has an inference function. So what we would do here is uh, really um, use the ingested video feed. And from there, these gauge and valve detect object detection would uh, kick in on that video feed. And from there, you are going to go ahead and see the values of the actual messages that are coming into the core. As you would see in the green grass core here, you could um, see the specific gauges names and the valve names, the video feed that it is ingesting, and also the bounding box locations will be uh, pretty soon inferred as you would see uh, soon. So um, what I'm doing here is just using the IoT test console, subscribing to all the messages. And within the messages itself, as you can see, you will see each of these different gauges, the value of the needle position for each of these gauges, as well as the bounding box location within the frame, which really tells the position within the frame for that particular gauge. Mm, so as you... Um, as you uh, put entire solution together, this is how the overall picture looks, right? So you have multiple gauges and valves and each of those values are coming together and all of that is available for that particular image. And you can even capture a screenshot of this particular uh, position of the gauge uh, remotely and uh, see the value uh, that has been inferred with these different green and blue fonts that you see on the screen. So um, the final picture that I wanted to show is that even when a user here, Alex from ConocoPhillips, is moving in and out of the frame, and even when Vicky joins uh, him in the frame, they move in and out, they are able to see the actual gauges and the valve readings of the overall um, system that the camera is focused on here. So that kind of brings us to the end of um, the solution walkthrough. 
So in conclusion, what I want to um, leave you with is there is this simple camera and the gateway that has been put together to deliver a remote monitoring solution. So I wanted to leave you with a couple of items that you could circle back with at a later point. Um, you could always engage AWS professional services. We do have um, these CAN offerings that we call, which are like 70-80% of the solution that is already pre-built and the last 20-30% is what we customize for the customers. Um, if um, the use cases and the problem statement are to be figured out, we usually start with the IoT discovery and design, that's a align offering as we call it. And then we also have uh, specific tailored offerings if it is a retail or a consumer-based product. Um, and in case of industrial settings, we usually go in with connected factory approach. And if there is a ML or a computer vision portion of it, then we go in with a computer and ML edge, uh, vision and ML edge based solution. With that, um, there are a lot many more options beyond uh, even AWS professional services. There is a IoT solutions link that you can find here, as well as an entire ecosystem of AWS uh, competency partners, the SI partners, device partners, and so much more. Um, I would encourage you to go check out those links for more details. And from there, um, if you want to uh, just learn about more about the services, um, as well as read more about the blogs of some of the colleagues have contributed. Uh, all of those are available at IoT Resources. Um, some of the quick start solutions uh, where you could uh, immediately play, uh, uh, play the solution on your Raspberry Pis or what have you on your EC2 instances, you could explore IoT Solutions page. Some of the code that was used uh, for the demonstration today is available at these links. Um, with all that, um, I would leave you and encourage you to uh, check out more about this session uh, at all of these resources. Thank you very much for the time that you have spent uh, today with us here. And uh, thank you, David, for co-presenting here with me.